Okay, so breaking news, late breaking news, and I'm trying to get the audio of President Obama's address about an hour ago. He spoke live to the to the country. Most of the country is not watching TV on Saturday nights, or they're watching um, UCLA bravely lose to uh, to Arizona State, you know, or wh- whatever. But on Saturday nights, people are not exactly sitting around flipping through CNN and Fox and MSNBC. But nevertheless, the White House comes on. They break in with the announcement that a deal has been made with Iran. After the president's speech, we go live to Geneva where it's, I don't know, it was 3 a.m. in Geneva, Switzerland. And Secretary of State John Kerry uh, made a very lengthy and occasionally circular statement. So we'll get you some of this and some early analysis. But the, the first pass on this, my first pass on this so-called deal with Iran, is that the Iranians dangled Enough good news for a press briefing, for a press release that could sound triumphant in the West. And in return, they get billions and billions and billions uh, of sanctions uh, in, in, in U.S. dollars in the form of sanctions lifted and access to money that's been frozen. And in return, really all they're doing is agreeing to a pause, a timeout in part of their program. And if if you're wondering, um, surely that guy on KFI is painting this out to be worse than it is. This this has got to be a good deal for the West. I mean, we we talk the Iranians down from making a nuclear weapon. No, no. By our own admission, that's not what this so-called deal is. This is not the Iranians dismantling their nuclear program. This is the Iranians getting access to billions and billions and billions in frozen assets in return for pausing part of their program. And that's just what we know from the public release over the past hour. So we'll uh, we'll talk about it, and we'll make the comparisons to Neville Chamberlain giving away Czechoslovakia to Hitler uh, and then telling us that Hitler's a gentleman who can be trusted. That and more coming up. It's the Dark Secret Place. Brian Suits in here until 10 p.m. on KFI AM 640. More stimulating talk radio. KFI AM 640, more stimulating talk radio, the dark secret place. Brian sits in here until 10 o'clock. So about an hour ago, the president of the United States speaking from the White House, announcing a interim deal with Iran, the, the six powers plus Iran, the, the, the P5 plus one, uh, as they're called, group of world powers negotiating a deal in Geneva went into the uh, the early hours there in Switzerland and the president making the announcement from the US not not the secretary of state John Kerry uh, not being the one to break the news there the the news was released in Switzerland but the first american reaction comes from the president on a saturday night so it's a big deal and uh, then John Kerry following. As, uh, some of the other, the France and Britain, uh, are, are releasing their statements. But here's what President Obama said uh, just about an hour ago about the, the deal uh, to dismantle the Iranian nuclear program. No. To completely stop the Iranian nuclear program. No. To guarantee that uh, the Iranians will not construct a nuclear bomb for the purpose of destroying uh, Israel. No. Uh, destroying their Arab neighbors. No. But in agreement to pause uh, nuclear enrichment, basically. Here's uh, the president at the White House about one hour ago. As I've said many times, my strong preference is to resolve this issue peacefully. And we've extended the hand of diplomacy. Yet, for many years, Iran's been unwilling to meet its obligations to the international community. So my administration worked with Congress, the United Nations Security Council, and countries around the world to impose unprecedented sanctions on the Iranian government. These sanctions have had a substantial impact on the Iranian economy. And with the election of a new Iranian president earlier this year, an opening for diplomacy emerged. I spoke personally with President Rouhani of Iran earlier this fall. Secretary Kerry has met multiple times with Iran's foreign minister. And we have pursued intensive diplomacy, bilaterally with the Iranians and together with our P5 plus one partners, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Russia, and China, as well as the European Union. Today, that diplomacy opened up a new path toward a world that is more secure. 
a future in which we can verify that Iran's nuclear program is peaceful and that it cannot build a nuclear weapon. While today's announcement is just a first step, it achieves a great deal. For the first time in nearly a decade, we have halted the progress of the Iranian nuclear program, and key parts of the program will be rolled back. Let me just jump right in there. Again, this is uh, the president from one hour ago saying that for the first time, the Iranians will halt their, their nuclear progress. That is the enrichment of uranium. Uh, and by the way, folks, plutonium, um, it doesn't uh, create electricity. It, plutonium doesn't power TV sets. Plutonium only blows up. That's what plutonium's for. Uh, th- this is uh, a declarative, definitive statement that the Iranians, like as we speak, have stopped this. No, they haven't. They've only agreed to do this if the United States and the other five powers release the frozen money, the billions and billions and billions. When we do, you can't unring that bell. We're not going to give the Iranians a dollar tonight. The Iranians have said... Yeah, we'll agree to a pause in the program, but you have to release that money. I mean, the money, all the money, the $60 billion plus that are uh, being frozen in the United States and Europe. You have to release it all. So, so just the fact that that deal was agreed to, and, and if you want to make the analogy that it's like a kidnapper, a kidnapper saying, um, well, I've, you know, I know that I've declared that uh, it's my desire to kill my hostage and that I've uh, I've cut off uh, the hostage's fingers and some toes and ma- mailed you an ear. And I continue to torture the hostage. I want you to release that money and then I'll release the hostage. They're not going to be a simultaneous thing. We're not going to meet in the desert and you're going to put the money down and I'm going to put the hostage down. You're going, that money has to clear my bank account. Then I will release a hostage. That's the best way I can put this. Now, is that any way for the most powerful country on earth to behave in the face of a tiny bully who wants to get on steroids and have nuclear weapons? When we have all the cards, we weren't using the cards. And I understand the president's claim that he's always wanted to resolve this diplomatically, but but that seems, in in fact, naive in the face of history, because that is like Neville Chamberlain in 1938 in Munich, somehow thinking that there is a way to appease or settle diplomatically and peacefully with Adolf Hitler, his lust for territory, and not recognizing on the face of it that every time you give him something, he just comes back and asks for more. In fact, if you reward them for the behavior, because what the Iranians have learned tonight is that the West is weak, that democracies are weak. Democracies, naturally, until war is forced upon them, um, shy away from doing the hard thing. Because you understand, the hard thing, after 10 years of observing the Iranians developing nuclear weapons, and there being absolutely no doubt, once they go past 15% enrichment, you understand, uh, you don't have to be a nuclear physicist to know this. Um, whether it's, uh, you know, Diablo Canyon or San Onofre or any other nuclear power plant in the United States or Canada or Japan, that, that uranium is not enriched past 15%. All it has to do is create heat, not blow up, heat. That's what nuclear power plants do. If you want nuclear power, the threshold for enriching uranium to create nuclear power is pretty low. They they got to that threshold five years ago. They went past it. There's only one, well, there's only one reason you go past it. There's 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 nothing that forty percent enriched uranium can do that fifteen percent can't do. Only takes a little longer. You go past the power generation threshold for one purpose to get to ninety percent. So that you have it enriched enough that it can fit into a missile or a bomb. It'd be strapped to a donkey or put in a container ship or on a missile. That's the purpose of going past it. Well, the Iranians have unzipped their fly. They've gone past that. And we're in the shadow period between electrical power generation and developing a bomb. What the Iranians have needed is time. What, how do you get time from the West? Well, you promise them that there won't be an immediate conflict before the next election cycle. And this is where we all have to just turn into cynics. Because if you don't think that this is more about American domestic politics than it is about world peace, then you are naive. 
if Obama and I'm I'm dead serious here. I'm not I'm I'm taking my political hat off. I'm telling you these are the facts on the ground as we're looking at them right now. If Obamacare had launched on October 1st without any hiccups and it was just <clears throat> unicorn factories, rainbow powered love machines and strawberry scented welfare checks for everybody, we would not be hearing about Iran tonight. That would be a triumph and Barack Obama would cruise to the finish line of his second uh term. And he would be the health care president. But the thing is crashing and burning. It's crashing and burning so badly, it's threatening the reelection of Senate Democrats. So the United States current government needs a W. They need a W so badly that they are polishing what happened in Geneva and calling it a diplomatic victory for the West. And it's so important that they're coming out on Saturday night. This is significant. No one's watching the news on Saturday night. But this has to be discussed tomorrow on the Sunday morning chat shows, on the chin wags. And then it has to hit your newspaper on Monday or the L.A. Times tomorrow. This is a how it's delivered is important. This tells you all you need to know. Was it a good deal? A good deal can wait till Monday. I got news for you. A good deal could wait till Monday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. It could wait. Good news. You deliver it when people are listening. Breaking news coming out of Geneva, Switzerland, that a preliminary deal has been announced by the White House in a in a rare, I mean, honestly, you know, in, in the news business. Um, one of the reasons that KFI has live shows on the weekend is so that if um, if uh, something Wong and We Too Low crash a triple seven, at, at San Francisco International Airport, we can have people live on the air uh, talking about the event or wildfires in SoCal, you know, or whatever. That's part of the reason that we have live shows. So it's it's great that this happened during the show that focuses on stuff like this. But I can also also tell you that over the span of the life of this show, six plus years, uh, it it is extraordinarily rare that news is breaking on Saturday night on the West Coast. And that, so that tells you one of two things. Either it is a really, really huge win for the U.S. or it is a lifeline for an administration that needs a political win. So uh, what we know about the deal right now is that it doesn't in any way dismantle the Iranian nuclear program. It doesn't get them to declare publicly that they'll stop seeking to build a nuclear weapon or stop uh, trying to arm themselves with nuclear weapons. It only temporarily pauses some of the enrichment of uranium. So it clearly is not a slam dunk. It is not a Dwight Howard Superman cape slam dunk. So it, therefore, it must be the other thing. It must be an administration trying desperately for a political lifeline to distract people from the disastrous rollout of a health care plan that a lot of political capital was spent upon. And as I say, if you're out there saying, oh, that's stupid, those two things have nothing to do with each other, then then you need to grow up and learn how politics is done, Democrats or Republicans. When when you're in the midst of the mud and you need a hand up, you, you anything, absolutely anything to distract people uh, will assist you. And in, in the case of what's going on in your individual health plans, uh, in, in November of 2013, never mind January of 2014, but in the midst of what's becoming a slow motion, um, family by family, household by household, slap in the face, in many cases, uh, the administration can't avoid blame. And so, um, does, would this color the negotiations? What, would John Kerry be sent to Geneva with the marching orders? Get me a deal? Well, I certainly hope not. I certainly hope not. But I'm not the target of an Iranian nuclear bomb. Los Angeles is not the target. Canyon country is. No. Uh, I'm not the target. You're not the target. The target feels like this was a cynical political calculation that was done to give the president of the United States uh, a uh, a distraction for at least one weekend in his own country to cover up a disastrous health care plan 
rollout. By <clears throat> by target, I'm talking about the uh, nation of Israel, which is not real happy about what is happening right now in Geneva. And then, oh, by the way, you know what? You know who else is not real happy? It's uh, the other targets of in Iranian nuclear weapon, and that would be um, the Arabs. That would be the uh, United Arab Emirates. That would be uh, Dubai, Abu Dhabi in the Emirates, Qatar, Bahrain, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia. And you know what? What the hell? Throw in, throw in Yemen. And 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 also the rarely spoke of Oman. Very quietly, very quietly, a very stable, wealthy, um, ardent. Supporter of U.S. policy in the Middle East, Oman. You, you, you know, you can't you can't swing a dead cat at the Arabian Peninsula without seeing and hitting Oman. Oman is that country down there on the lower right. You never hear about Oman. But all those countries, all those Arabs, all those Sunni Arabs, and then, oh, yeah, by the way, all of those Jews in Israel, they all have one common cause, and that is the fact that They don't want to see a Persian nuclear bomb. And they were counting on, not the UN, not the Humane Society, not the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, not NASA, not the Future Farmers of America. They were counting on the United States of America to prevent the Iranians from gaining a nuclear weapon, not pausing, not slowing down, but dismantling the program. Finding out what is it that you want? What is it that you think the nuclear weapon is going to get you? Because that's how you run that negotiation. As you say, what, what do you seek to get with a nuclear weapon? What's it going to give you? Is there something that you can, can you get it without having to get a nuclear weapon? And if their answer is no, we have to get a nuclear weapon because, because what we want out of that weapon is leverage, is power, is terror. Well, then that would be the end of the negotiations, and the carrier air groups and the B-2s would begin doing their work. Now, if the Iranians really wanted to negotiate, they would say, well, there is a reason. Um, It's because we feel insecure. We're not having children anymore. Uh, The sanctions are killing our economy. We feel vulnerable. And, you know, after all, this is an this is a ethnicity. These, these are, we are a people with, with 8,000 years of recorded history, the Persian people, and we feel like we are up against the wall and we're the final generation of Persians. Now, if you can pack that into your 200-year-old American mind, then maybe you can help us out. But the Iranians didn't say that. They said, because it's our right, because we want to, because you can't stop us. That was one of the reasons that they continue to enriching uranium uh, or continue to enrich uranium is because they can because nobody has stopped them, because they have not paid a price. The sanctions, well, they're tough. But this is a country, recall, this is a country of effectively born into sanctions. This country was born addicted to crack. This country was born with a bad hand. When they kicked the Shah out, and then they chose, uh, you know, occupied the American embassy for 444 days, Europe, and Jimmy Carter locked down their assets. They have been living with sanctions since they have been the Islamic Republic of Iran. They are masters of doing end runs around the sanctions. Saddam Hussein, he was a piker. He has nothing on the Iranians. Saddam Hussein learned after 91 that money and buying politicians in Britain, that can get you, you know, um, a new Mercedes and a better palace, the whole thing. The Iranians, on the other hand, the Iranians have made a career, they've made an industry of getting around worldwide sanctions. And what's the proof of that? Well, there's flying models that are proof of that. The Iranians still fly the F-14 Tomcat. The Iranians fly the F-4 Phantom. The F-4 Phantom is in museums in the United States, but it's on the front lines of the Iranian Air Force because they can get spare parts. Well, guess what? The world has agreed not to sell the Iranian spare parts for F-14 Tomcats and F-4 Phantoms. Yet there they are flying. They're not making them. 
they're they're trying. They actually have a very uh, robust internal spare parts industry. They've had to, just like South Africa did in the eighties. But they they are they're also finding out that they don't have to because you can buy anything when you have money. So so clearly you're dealing you're negotiating with people who think that they have all the aces up their sleeve. And you're coming to the poker table, and you're bringing a gigantic sledgehammer, and you're saying, oh, you're wondering what that is? That's if I lose. That's if you win four hands in a row, then I'm bringing that out. But instead, we got there and we said, oh, don't don't worry, the sledgehammer is down in the car. I'm not. I'm just here to play poker, just a good, honest game of poker. Deal the cards. Let me buy in. We'll be back in just a minute. Uh, this is the, that's that's my first pass. What does the New York Times say about this so-called deal that is being announced breathlessly on a Saturday night by the administration? How does Al Jazeera cover the news two hours old now out of Geneva, Switzerland, that world powers have reached a nuclear deal with Iran at the Geneva talks? Uh, I'll say it for you, 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 you can probably, if you can't figure it out, uh, well, you, you probably can't. Um, how is Israel reacting to this Benjamin Netanyahu? Well, he's a bit critical. But the Israeli media, um, Haaretz, the left-leaning newspaper, Jerusalem Post, I'll, I'll give you their initial reaction uh, as well. But as I say, I don't want to make this, you know, a um, how do the Israelis see this? How do the Gulf neighbors see this? How is Al Jazeera, uh, based in uh, in in uh, Qatar, how are they viewing this? Because they're looking across the Persian Gulf or Arabian Gulf, depending on who you are, and they're looking at a country that is uh, financially strapped, uh, but nevertheless finding enough money to develop nuclear weapons, and they're wondering why are they doing this? Thank thank golly that uh, we have a long-standing relationship with the United States because surely they would never let the Iranians get nuclear weapons because it's not just the Israelis, but it's us too. So so how are they viewing it? Well, Al Jazeera is putting up a photo, and this is this is something that I, I learned the hard way about Al Jazeera. Um, in, in the United States, at the L.A. Times, there's a picture of sort of the negotiation table, <clears throat> right, uh, on the cover of the L.A. Times right now. And uh, the Iranian guy, the foreign minister, Mohammad Zarif, is there. And uh, the uh, European Union diplomat, Catherine Ashton, is there. And it's sort of a general, you know, there's no editorial in the photo. It's just sort of a photo of people around a round table. Well, at Al Jazeera, on the uh, the story, World Powers Reach Nuclear Deal with Iran at Geneva Talks, there's two people in the photo. On the left is European Union diplomat Catherine Ashton. There she is, her legs crossed at the knees, wearing a smart blue suit with a blue scarf. And she's looking a bit bemused, a little maybe exhausted, looking straight forward. Next to her is the Iranian foreign minister, Mohammad Javed Sarif. And he's sitting there with his legs spread, not crossed, wearing a black suit and a white shirt with no tie. Silver beard, silver goatee, um, uh, receding hairline, glasses, and he's grinning at the camera. And his hands are clasped, interlocked fingers uh, in his lap. And and this is something you have to know about Al Jazeera. They they have access, just like BBC or LA Times, they have access to hundreds of photos that they could be using. But the one they're using shows the European female diplomat sitting there looking like she's on the worst first date of her life. And next to her is the Iranian foreign minister who looks like the cat amongst the pigeons, as they say in uh, in Great Britain. Um, that's before we even get to the story. Iran and six world powers, including the United States, have reached a deal to limit Tehran's nuclear program and ease the tough international sanctions that have long been imposed because of it. Part of the deal, and this is... Um, this this might be John Kerry's uh, signature moment as Secretary of State. I, I sense it is. But uh, in the speech he gave, in the statement that he gave after the White House was done, the, the President Obama spoke live. Then they closed out the mic, and John Kerry in Geneva, uh, a couple hours ahead of uh, of the East Coast of the U.S. Even though most of us would go to bed at 3 a.m., go back to Sofitel 
take a quick shower, drop in that soft Swiss bed with the really thick down covers on top of you and just get a good night's sleep. John Kerry saw cameras, he saw lights, and then, oh, look, someone brought a microphone, so he comes out and speaks. And also because he has to. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry says that if Iran's nuclear program is truly for peaceful purposes, then it simply needs to, quote, prove it to the world. Close quote. Kerry spoke in Geneva after a marathon negotiating session lasting about 18 hours that culminated with a first step deal between Iran and six world powers, including the U.S. The deal is designed to curb Iran's nuclear program. <clears throat> That's how it's designed. Uh, speaking to reporters early Sunday morning Swiss time, I mean the time in Switzerland, Kerry also insisted that the first step deal will make Israel safer. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has loudly criticized the deal, saying the international community is giving up too much uh, on Iran. And now, now, by the way, I don't know if John Kerry was fatigued, exhausted, or whatever, but the Iranians can prove that it's a peaceful nuclear program. Um, uh, uh, well, I guess I'm, I'm going. I'm getting ahead of myself. If what the West, what John Kerry, Secretary of State John Kerry is asking for is proof. In other words, generate power with your nuclear power. Because that, that's a peaceful use of nuclear uh, technology, is it not? Is to generate electrical power. I mean, we're doing it in the U.S., the Japanese, you know, we, the French, 90% of the electricity in France is generated with nuclear power. So obviously, all you have to do is generate nuclear power, and you prove your peaceful intentions, right? Well, the Iranians can light a incandescent bulb tomorrow with nuclear power. Oh, wait, they already are. They do have nuclear power. So you talk about closing the barn door after the bulls escaped. Um, all they have to do is say, well, look, we are. We already have nuclear electricity generation plants. We're already generating nuclear electricity. Nuclear generated electricity. It's, we're doing it. We've done it. So in other words, they've already hit the bar that John Kerry set tonight. Prove it. Okay. Look, you see that light that's on? There you go. That somehow is in complete ignorance of the fact that you can be enriching uranium for medical purposes, for research purposes, and for electrical purposes. And oh, by the way, the same centrifuges that enriched that uranium so that you can make a bagel, a toasted bagel, I should say, the same uranium uh, enrichment centrifuges that made the power generation uranium can keep going when the lights are out or no one's watching, and they can continue to enrich the uranium to 90%, which is bomb grade. Well, now, President Obama said that part of this agreement is that the Iranians will not construct any new centrifuges, um, and that they'll stop using the ones that they've made. Well, but the devil is in the details. The inspection regime, as that's called, that the Iranians have agreed to. Now, now keep in mind, the Iranians have, um, uh, you know, Saddam had to write the script uh, day by day by day because he, he was the first to have these invasive inspection regimes, right? UN officials bombing around his country, demanding to come into palaces here and there. And Saddam said, not that one, not that one. Okay, you can go to that one, but you have to give us a week's notice, things like that. The Iranians, they took notes. And then also the U.N. handling of North Korea. The Iranians took notes. They saw where the West got tired, where the West backed off, and where the West pushed. The Iranians took notes, and they implemented the notes. The Iranians have, and maybe you're hearing this from me for the first time ever, But the Iranians have simultaneously constructed two almost identical parallel appearing nuclear facilities in their country. One facility is real. It is really enriching uranium. That's a facility that's marked baby milk factory, car upholstery center, etc. They have been pouring billions into this simultaneously. They have been pouring billions into plausible and functional research facilities that the Western inspectors will arrive at in a month or two months. And they'll be told, here it is, previously off limits. But now, for you, because of this agreement, come on in and we'll shut them down. This is a real deal. Uh, And all of this for the purpose of going on American TV and the administration saying, 
Look at this dangling, shiny object. Stop paying attention to Obamacare. Look at this. Look at this singular achievement of this administration. We'll be back in just a minute. The the news still breaking out of Switzerland. The deal announced at the White House uh, about an hour and a half ago, uh, that were coming up on two hours ago, by President Obama and then expanded on by Secretary of State John Kerry in Geneva is still being uh, parsed. But the initial reaction from Israel is... That's a bad deal because the Iranians still get to have a nuclear bomb program. Now, and, and keep in mind, no one has ever denied that the Iranians can have a nuclear, a peaceful nuclear program, a power generation program, a medical research program, et cetera, et cetera. It's that it's been so blatantly obvious that they have been uh, seeking to enrich uranium to the point of uh, producing a armada of uh, an armory of uh, nuclear bombs. And as much as admitted to by the prior president, uh, uh, and, and that would be not just Sadeh, sometimes called, uh, um, pardon me, uh, 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 Ahmadinejad, sometimes called Ahmadinejad by people who uh, don't know how to pronounce his name, but the former president, uh, Ahmadinejad, as much as admitted it, you know, especially in front of a domestic crowd. He would announce different enrichment levels and things like that. And he was an engineer. He knew full well what it meant to reach 25% enrichment uh, or 20% enrichment. So uh, anyway, with a uh, new Iranian, quote, moderate, close quote, president, the uh, it, it, it was determined that a, a door was opening to uh, to diplomacy. Now, John Kerry, in his statement, I'm, I'm trying to find the audio, but I can't find it so far. But I have the transcript of the statement in his statement. And he went on at length for like 15 minutes. He said that the purpose of the sanctions, all these low, these many years against Iran, the purpose of the sanctions was not for the Iranians to stop or reject or publicly renounce the construction of nuclear bombs. It was to come and negotiate. That is news to me. It's news to Jimmy Carter, news to Ronald Reagan, news to George Bush, news to Bill Clinton, news to George Bush. Apparently, not news or something to Barack Obama. But the the four prior administrations thought, pardon me, the the five prior administrations thought that the sanctions were to punish Iran for being an international pariah on whatever level, whether it's supporting terrorism uh, through their agents, Hezbollah in Lebanon, or creating, uh, making nuclear bombs. But uh, so anyway, here is the Iranian uh, foreign minister, Zarif, speaking in Geneva just a, a few minutes ago. I believe it is important that we all of us see uh, the opportunity to end an unnecessary crisis and open new horizons based on respect for the rights of Iranian people and removal of any uh, doubts about the exclusively peaceful nature of Iran's nuclear program. These have been and will remain our objective, and I'm confident that through cooperation we can move forward. This is only a first step. It's an important achievement, but this is a first step. We need to work together uh, based on the same principles on which we started, principles of equal footing, mutual respect, and common benefit so that we can put an end uh, to this unnecessary and rather sad chapter. And by that he means the sanctions. And now now it it helps a lot at this point to look at this from the Iranian side. What crisis are they facing that requires them to go to Geneva in the first place? They they weren't there three years ago, five years ago, ten years ago. Well, it's that the sanctions are actually having an effect, finally. The the sanctions on the Iranian economy are are devastating. The The Iranian government which I occasionally call the Iranian government, uh, have stopped subsidizing gasoline, cooking oil, flour, all the things that they have been subsidizing for years, even during the Shah. I mean, for decades, they have been subsidizing staples. Staples. And in the U.S., we, we, don't, we don't live like this. We don't know how this works. But in, in Iran, 
um, in, in Iraq and in Saddam's Iraq and in, in many, many countries in the Middle East and in Africa, the government keeps a lid on people's uh, discordancy by subsidizing staples. And in Iran, flour, cooking oil, those things that, that they on a daily basis have to interact with. In America, you go to your pantry and you bought cooking oil two weeks ago at Costco. It's not a daily thing. You don't have to get it every single day. We don't use cooking oil like that. Do you bake bread in your house every morning at 5 a.m.? Probably not. But the majority of, of Iranian households actually bake bread. Flour is a daily staple. It's been, it's been subsidized. Well, about a year ago, the Iranian government had to stop the subsidies. The Iranian uh, currency went in the pooper. Dollars became the default currency in Iran. The Iranian government was, was gobsmacked by this. This, this was before Rouhani, the new president, was elected, and this affected the Iranian people. They're like, you know, I'm not even using my currency. I'm using Amer- You're telling me that these guys are the great Satan. I've been believing that they're the great Satan, but now I'm using their currency to get gas in my own country. And we're one of the leading exporters of petroleum, yet we don't refine it in our own country. What has happened? So with that kind of pressure, the Iranian government saying, well, we got, we got to free up this money. We have to lighten up these sanctions and we have to free up these billions that are, that are sitting in banks in Europe and the U.S. What do the democracies want? Well, the democracies want to be reelected. Thing one, they want to be reelected. What does it take for them to be reelected? <clears throat> well, little victories. So clearly, what is crystal clear? There are two possibilities. The Iranians have said, we're wrong to be developing nuclear weapons, even though we're no longer having babies and the, the Persian people are going to be extinct in 35 years and nuclear weapons would level the playing field in the Middle East. We're wrong to pursue them. Let's stop it right now. Let's give up the program, get to Geneva, talk to this Kerry and the other five uh, powers, tell them that we're ready to stop the nuclear program. There's that, right? Except that's not what happened tonight. Or there's the other thing where they tell their foreign minister, get to, get to Geneva, say handsome, pretty words in that lovely English that you speak, and make it sound like you're prepared to begin negotiating the end of our nuclear bomb. Pro- now, you heard, or I guess rather, you did not hear him say anything about nuclear weapons, only about the West recognizing Iran's right to nuclear development, Right. So clearly the marching orders there are say whatever it takes to lift the sanctions, even just a little bit. We need some of these billions released so that we can start subsidizing cooking oil, flour, and gasoline because our people are PO'd. They're not only angry at us, but they stopped having babies 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Women aren't getting married. Women who are getting married aren't having babies. Women who are getting married and having babies are only having one baby. So we're running out of Iranians because it sucks here. How can, what, what, what can we do until we have the North Korean Trump card? And again, you have to blame George W. Bush for this. The minute the North Koreans showed the entire world that you're a international pariah and part of the axis of evil right up until you successfully test a nuclear weapon, that gave the Iranians the blueprint, which is hang on. Release handsome, pretty statements, shake hands, take pictures until we can actually test a nuclear weapon and announce that we're a nuclear power, because then it is hands off. Cynical? Oh, sure, maybe. Uh, but anyway, that's that's my take on what uh, what happened earlier tonight. As I say, you 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 saw the Iranian foreign minister sitting there talking about respect. I believe it is important. Nuclear research. We all of us see uh, the opportunity to end an unnecessary crisis. And op- he makes it sound like they're, they don't have any responsibility in this. Okay, The United States, Israel, the P6 powers, no one made this up out of whole cloth. He, he's in complete denial publicly that they're pursuing a nuclear bomb. He makes it sound like, oh, this is a made-up crisis. We've extended our hand, etc. So... If you're wondering who the winners and losers are, as I said in the last break, just go to Al Jazeera and check out the picture that they put on the web of the European Union diplomat looking like she's on the worst first date ever, sitting next to this guy. 
with his legs spread and his fingers interlocked with a big grin on his face. That's the reason they put that picture up, and it says a lot.